will be our third dis discussion on upper GI bleeding. The last two, the first one we concentrated on when a person presents with hematemesis. Then the second one was if a person with upper GI bleeding comes with melina. This one we are going to consider if the bleeding is, the upper GI bleed is uh, not very severe. In a minor form it happens, so the patient doesn't notice it. But of course with chronic blood loss, he gets anemic. So, so the third presentation how upper GI bleed can present is with the occult blood loss presenting as features of anemia. So what will be the clinical situation in this case? So look at this history. So a lady who feels short of breath during exertion and of course she says it's two to three months because it's a chronic history sometimes they will not remember exactly the duration but of course uh, it's a bit of a chronic history. So now, now supposing now this person has occult blood loss but of course the presentation is breathless on exertion. So we have to find the diagnosis for the patient. So to analyze this in a physiological manner, what is actually this uh, shortness of breath on exertion means? It is actually a tachypnea. The respiratory center gets stimulated and the person breathes faster. And the breathing comes to you know, normal breathing. We don't, it's, we are not conscious of it. But when, you, when the breathing rate is fast, you, it comes to the conscious feeling and then of course there is some feeling of fatigueness also with this and then we call this as, as breathlessness or short of breath. Now, now this in this patient this happens during exertion. So what are the stimuli for the respiratory center? One is hypoxia, second one is hypercapnia, third one is acidosis. So if it is an exertional dyspnea, out of these three, the only possibility is that it could be hypoxia. But if a person is breathless even during rest, then all three are possible. So this is exertional dyspnea, so it is likely to be a hypoxia. So what are the causes of hypoxia, the types? The respiratory, that is... There's a problem of oxygenation in the lung. But the heart is all right to pump the blood and there is adequate hemoglobin. The second form is stagnant hypoxia, where the heart fails to pump. The oxygenation from the lung is okay, but with cardiac failure, of course, this also may get affected. But anyway, the primary problem is in the heart and also there is adequate hemoglobin. The third one is anemic hypoxia, that is the lung is okay to oxygenate well, heart can pump well, but of course there is inadequate hemoglobin. So these are the three possibilities in this person present with, with exertional dyspnea and histotoxic hypoxia is also unlikely in exertional dyspnea. So now what is the history we are going to take? So we can exclude or confirm one by one because until then we, we are not sure what is the cause. It could be either of these it is external external dyspnea. So the history we first make an inquiry into the respiratory symptoms like cough, uh, any hemoptysis, pleuritic pains, uh, production of sputum, and history of wheezing. So if everything is not there, so it's it is unlike to be a respiratory problem. Then we take a cardiac history, any chest pain, and also any paroxysmal nocturnal dyspnea. Uh, history of edema and of course in your medical history the, there may be some predisposing factor for the cardiac disease like hypertension or diabetes, hypercholesterolemia, maybe already diagnosed ischemic heart disease patient and also even for respiratory there may be uh, symptoms of primary disease like let's say tuberculosis uh, like uh, night sweats or even in pyrexia, cachectic features or maybe two uh, problems of uh, or some uh, malignancy in the lung. 
So, but of course, if there are no cardiac or respiratory symptoms suggestive of uh, hypoxia this day, then the possibility is that it could be a anemic hypoxia. So, now then again, we have to go into detail to find what, why, what is the cause for anemia. Is it a problem of production? So, one thing is of course your dietary has to be good and also if there is any bone marrow problem like a bone marrow infiltration, some, some form of a blood dyscrasia like leukemia or multiple myeloma with a lot of backache. Uh, in a leukemia, of course, in a acute, the history will be very short. And uh, is there any problem of uh, hemolysis? So, the hemolytic anemias. So, in those cases, usually there will be a history of, there may be a history of intermittent jaundice. And also, they may have hepatosplenomegaly, so some dyspeptic symptoms, feeling fullness, maybe some abdominal pain. And a uh, Hemolytic anemia, of course, if they have caused uh, stones, they may have biliary colleagues. Uh, so, or is there a blood loss? So, the per now the person comes with shortage of breath on exertion. So, we have excluded the respiratory cardiac and uh, also hemolysis unlikely, uh, bone marrow problem is unlikely. In the, but I am talking with the person that we, ha we are talking today. So, it could be a blood loss. So, it's important to ask, is there a history of hematemesis, history of melina, or is have you had any bleeding PR? Because the patient may, he problem for the patient is the shortness of breath. But when you ask, okay, he, he might say, yes, I have uh, on and off bleeding PR. But of course, it's a low GRB in that case. So, and also in a female, the menstrual history. Is there any excessive menses? And also we have to take a history. Say, sp supposing the person has noticed some melina or hematomas, or even otherwise, any dyspeptic history, such as of peptic ulcer disease or a gastric carcinoma, like loss of appetite, loss of weight. And also they may have epigastric pains. And like a history of suggestion of a cecal cancer, yeah, like uh, subacute obstructions because the uh, idol cecal valve well getting occluded, central abdominal colic pain, some distension. If it's advanced disease, uh, uh, give a secondary, so right hypochondria, fullness. And in your medical history, the history of taking NSAIDs, which may be suggestive of a upper GI bleed. So, with your history, you have to cover all this. Uh, and at the end, you may find some reason, some suspicion, like a strong dyspeptic history. Patient is on aspirin. Or the person has a, uh, he has felt something different, the right, right fossa, or has features of subacute obstruction coming up. Or you may not have anything in the history. Because the bleeding is occult and there are no person has not noticed anything. So, if, so you have to have a very open mind. Then get on to examination. So, pause the video and just think in this type of history. Person with shortness of breath on exertion, we had a differential diagnosis. But now we think it's likely to be a, a anemia. But still, the other cardio, cardiac and respiratory things should be again excluded in the examination. So, just pause the video and think what are the focused physical signs that you are going to look in this patient. So, think you uh, take a pa uh, piece of paper, write down and check your knowledge. Uh, you have, I am sure you have this background knowledge and your application, you can check for yourself. It is very important to be interactive rather than just listening. So, pause the video. Uh, restart and have a look once you have written down. So one thing is of course if you are to see whether the person is pale. So if you, the person is pale, you know that uh, your diagnosis, clinical diagnosis by the history of uh, anemia is probably correct. Look for lymphadenopathy because they, this may be present uh, if say like a gastric cancer you may have a left supracular lymph node palpable or some uh, blood dyscrasia and then uh, Complete examination of the cardiovascular and respiratory systems are important to exclude again 
even though your history you thought it's unlikely but again look for them is there any uh, any arrhythmias or uh, any cardiac murmurs say evidence of a uh, evidence of a heart failure like a uh, elevated jvp or evidence of cardiomegaly and a respiratory system any signs of lung disease like a maybe deviated trachea some changes in breath sounds evidence of fibrosis of the lung or uh, evidence of uh, of uh, chronic obstructive airways disease so now is the person we are discussing today so person was pale there's no lymphadenopathy and both cardiovascular and respiratory systems were normal then abdominal examination important things are okay look for distension ascites because they may be features of uh, malignancy and also if there's a cecal mass subacute obstruction uh, you may have some distension look for hepatosplenomegaly because these are features in uh, you may see hepatosplenomegaly in hemolytic anemias but hepatosplenomegaly alone may be secondary from a primary either gastric malignancy or cecal malignancy which is the cause for the problem and also again palpable masses so if you have epigastric mass you wonder whether it's a problem in the in the liver or if your right iliac fossa mass is it a cecal cancer so at the end of the examination you may have some clue to the diagnosis supposing you had epigastric mass so hello epigastric mass maybe gastric cancer or just some epigastric tenderness person on nsaids may be a peptic ulcer bleeding right iliac fossa mass is it a cecal cancer so the person today we are discussing who presented with this the lady who presented with uh this uh, evidence of uh, the shortness of breath we excluded the cardiac and uh, respiratory causes we thought it's anemia and there was no evidence of uh, any prior production problem there's no evidence of hemolysis so we thought it's probably uh, blood loss she didn't have uh, menorrhagia and of course she had a dyspeptic history she had a dyspeptic history and she was on aspirin so we made a provisional diagnosis uh, and other parts of the examination were normal there were she was pale no lymphadenopathy nothing in abdomen we could feel so we thought it's a peptic ulcer disease so now how are we going to investigate so again you can write down your thoughts what what are the things that you will do in your investigations pause the video and just see as a doctor whether you are is now tuned to use your background the pathology knowledge and whatever pharmacology any any knowledge in the treatment also uh, to manage this patient if you restart the video and have a look whether you have got things correct initially of course you have to confirm that it is a iron deficiency anemia that is with a full blood count and a blood fill you can do that and of course you can do further studies to confirm it's a iron deficiency like ferritin levels and then you have to look for a source of blood loss now here of course the person had a dyspeptic history was on aspirin so it is very likely to be a upper GI bleed uh, now, of course, the blood losses we know it could be a gynecological and gastrointestinal. So, I'm talking in a general manner, so you have to exclude both. Or here, the person has the evidence of gastrointestinal upper GI bleed. So, we did a upper GI endoscopy, and the person had a uh, duodenal ulcer. So, and of course, we checked for the H. pylori, which was positive, and then she was treated appropriately. Now, supposing now this person had a dyspeptic, sometimes you, you have you don't have much of a clue in your uh, other than the hints that the person has a uh, blood loss, the history and examination we have not found a uh, clue. And for that matter, it's important to do uh, PR and PD also in this patient on examination. So, if you have not found uh, a definite cause, one thing else, of course. Uh, ultrasound is necessary to exclude gynecology or pathologies and for the GI if if we have not found the, uh, the site of bleeding which actually now this occult blood loss it could be uh, occult blood loss anemia the likely cause areas are 
the upper GI bleed and it could be coming from the small intestine or it could be the right side colon because the left side uh, problems they usually tend to see the blood with the stool bright red but of course even if you, if it's a slow bleed again they may not see so if, if your history and examination doesn't point out to a place then of course you'll have to screen the entire bowel so anyway here also first we do the upper GI endoscopy because it's easy to do the upper GI endoscopy and exclude but the patient we are discussing had a dyspeptic history so anyway upper GI endoscopy is necessary but if it's not localizing we have to do the entire uh, intestines uh, so uh, you start with the upper GI endoscopy and if it doesn't show anything then look at the colon do a colonoscopy now when you do the upper GI endoscopy in this type of patient if you just see some uh, e crocker you will see a bit of gastritis but always better do the colonoscopy if there is a significant anemia because you cannot miss a sickle cancer uh, so it's generally advisable to do both now if both are normal then we have to look at the small intestine in one of the methods that we discussed earlier I mean occult blood loss there is not much of a point uh, doing a angiogram because with very small bleeds it's unlikely to find a cause but then this type of situation if you can't localize then of course radioisotope scans also are possible it can actually localize the region of the bleeding but generally uh, most of the cases presenting with iron deficiency anemia uh, with this generally with upper GI and colonoscopy you can find because majority will have upper GI bleed or a, or a bleed from the colon uh, these uh, small bowel conditions with bleeding it's not very common but once you exclude these two if nothing is seen still person has uh, uh, evidence of uh, bleeding small bowel has to be looked at and then uh, after confirming the diagnosis uh, then the management is of course it's very easy it depends on the cause of the problem now our patient had a uh, peptic ulcer a duodenal ulcer H pyr positive and then she was treated with triple therapy and continue on PPI so so depending on the cause after you identify uh, you will do the necessary treatment uh, yeah, it will be a banding uh, carcinoma stomach will need a, a gastrectomy if a patient is fit and it's not advanced disease and again small bowel tumors it will be a resection meckles if it's a bleeding meckles you have to resect Crohn's it's mostly medical management Crohn's doesn't bleed that much uh, but of course they can present with anemia due to vitamin deficiencies due to malabsorptions and maybe fistulas many reasons and if it's the right colonic cancer you have to do a right hemicolectomy so but anyway looking back of our theme is on upper GI bleeding uh, so of course for completion uh, we have added all this but again to revise what we have done upper GI bleeding can present in three uh, four manners hematemesis we discussed what uh, the differential diagnosis then they can come with melina when it is melina the differential diagnosis is more than a hematemesis only because your small bowel and your right colon also get involved in the differential diagnosis and then they can come with occult blood loss presenting with anemia shortness of breath on exertion and of course you have to first exclude your cardiac and respiratory causes then anemia you again take a history to see exclude other forms of anemia and examination you do and then uh, again if it's a blood loss causing the anemia the blood loss or cold blood loss again the differential diagnosis is just like melina it is not only the upper GI it could be small intestine or right colon so everything has to be covered and then once the diagnosis the treatment is straightforward 